Press Awareness Month, a time when the ALS Society of Canada raises awareness and funds for research and support to those who suffer from this tragic disease. About 3,000 Canadians are at any one time living with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. This rapidly progressive neurological disorder can strike anyone, young or old, regardless of age and regardless of socioeconomic status. As the disease progresses, cost of care and equipment becomes exorbitant and is often borne by family members. The need for research and support to families is critical. In memory of our late colleague, Maurice Belanger, whose sudden and rapid demise from ALS affected this house profoundly, let us vow to increase resources dedicated to the disease. But first, join the virtual walk to end ALS on June 19th. The Honourable Member for Barry Springwater, Oro Medonte. Madam Speaker, over the past 18 months, our economy has been struggling due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now we have another looming crisis that threatens to drastically affect our economy and even shut down many Canadian production facilities. There is a global shortage of precious and important semiconductors. I have recently spoken with many local car dealerships that are having problems receiving new inventory due to this shortage. I have also been in discussion with Napoleon Fireplaces and Barbecues that is headquartered and manufactures in Barrie, Springwater, Oromodonte. Napoleon's shortage is so dire that in approximately seven days, they will be out of inventory, therefore no longer able to manufacture product and could potentially be forced to lay off hardworking Canadians. This semiconductor shortage has the potential to affect tens of thousands of supply chain, manufacturing and distribution jobs across Canada. Madam Speaker, I have brought this serious and imminent matter up to the Liberal government. Now we all need to cross party lines to work together and avert this looming crisis and keep hardworking Canadians producing great Canadian products. The Honourable Member Surrey Newton. Madam Speaker, on June 4th, in front of Surrey City Hall, the South Asian community will hold a candlelight vigil to remember the 215 Indigenous children whose remains were found in Kamloops on the grounds of Canada's largest former residential school. The vigil, which is one of hundreds happening across this country, is to show solidarity with all Indigenous communities in Canada. This terrible tragedy has touched us all, regardless of race, religion, geography, or cultural background, we are all mourning these innocent souls who were subjected to appalling abuse under the residential school system. Madam Speaker, Canadians are standing united in support of different future for Indigenous peoples. The Honourable Member for Abitibi, James Bay, Nunavik, EU. Madam Speaker, June is Indigenous History Month. This year, the theme is obvious. It goes straight to the heart. It's about children. Children like the 215 who were found buried anonymously at the Kamloops Residential School without respect and without humanity. Children like all the others who've disappeared and who may have suffered the same fate, torn from their families, their culture, and their land, Children who've had their identity, their pride, and their dignity taken away from them. Children who had residential schools imposed on them over almost two centuries of racism and whose consequences are still being felt today. Children like the murdering and mi missing and murdered Indigenous girls who are still owed justice two years to the day after the report of the National Inquiry. We owe it to these kids that this Indigenous History Month be not just a commemoration. We owe them respect, justice, equality, and reconciliation nation to nation. It's our duty, Madam Speaker. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Hochelaga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a woman, I couldn't keep quiet about what happened yesterday in the House. Eighty members of the official opposition voted for a bill that restricts a woman's right to make decisions about her own body. That's most of the members in the official opposition. Ms. Madam Speaker, this debate is over and we can't go back in time. Women have suffered enough to win their rights. This bill overrides women's fundamental rights. It's absurd. How can we again and again have to question women's rights? 
for all the women who advocated, who demonstrated, and those who follow us, including my daughter in her 20s, we need to put a stop to this irresponsible threat to a woman's right to choice. As a member of a progressive and feminist party, I would like to tell all women that this government will always defend their right to choice and their right to control their own bodies. Thank you. Hudson Warner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is my privilege today to recognize Medicine Hat Alberta in its historic national achievement in reaching functional zero chronic homelessness. For Medicine Hat, functional zero means there were three or less individuals experiencing chronic homelessness in the community over three consecutive months. Medistat achieved this dynamic milestone by developing an effective data collection strategy, by creating strong community partnerships, and by designing systems with engagement from people with lived experience. They continuously conduct reviews in order to improve systems and enjoy support from a very engaged community. Speaker, ending homelessness does not mean that people will never again be homeless. It means that systems are in place to ensure that any experience of homelessness is rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. It's time we stop managing homelessness and begin ending it. Let Medicine Hat be a living example that broken systems can be fixed and homelessness can be solved. To Robin, Jamie, and the team from Medicine Hat Community Housing, and everyone who's been part of making this a reality, well done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Milton. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Like most Canadians, I found it really tough to stay physically active over the last 15 months. Sport, physical activity, and recreation are super important for our physical and mental health, but it also builds communities, helps maintain our connections and our friendships. Being active is an essential part of Canadian life, but it's been especially hard for kids and families. That's why I was so excited to see $80 million over the next two years for Canada's active recovery in Budget 2021. These investments will remove barriers to participation, increased enrollment, and help kickstart organized sports programs that are accessible to every Canadian. This Saturday, June 5th, is also National Health and Fitness Day. It's, uh, it's a great chance to set some goals for the summer or try some new activities with your family. It's a great time for a healthy new habit. So I'm challenging all of my MP colleagues, do something active this weekend and encourage your communities to get moving as well. Post it on social media with show us your moves or hashtag NHFD 2021 et en français, bouge avec nous. If you need a few ideas, check out activeforlife.com and have a healthy and active weekend. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. I believe you're on mute. We'll start the clock over and you can start from the top. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to speak about a community in my riding locally known as AP. It's often called Alex Park, but its proper name is Alexandra Park. While Alex Park's roots run deep, its branches reach the sky. The community boasts that it sends more of its kids per capita to post-secondary school than any other public housing project in Canada. A few years back, it turned itself into a co-op housing community. The co-op is named for the man who had this vision of self-determination, Sonny Atkinson. Even during the pandemic, Alex Park is rebuilding itself, adding new homes and new hope to the neighborhood, the community center, which is at the heart of AP. And during COVID, it's seen its young leaders rise to the challenge. They've built a bigger kitchen, turned spare rooms into a food bank, and delivered groceries to families in need while delivering home-cooked meals to hundreds and hundreds of seniors every day, every week, every month. Resilient, remarkable, beautiful and bold, caring and full of characters. It's an honor to be their MP, and it's an honor to share their story with Canada through Parliament. The Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Speaker, on March 25th, Seth Notley, a 10-year-old boy from Port Lambton, suffered cardiac arrest on a playground. Seth suffers from a rare heart condition, and he has been in hospital and treatment for treatment and recovery since his health emergency. Even in the middle of lockdown, people and businesses in Wallaceburg stepped up to raise money to offset the expenses incurred by his family while in treatment. Several thousand dollars were raised by the community. Riverport Restaurant donated 50 cents from every breakfast and one dollar from every dinner they served on April 8th. Big Chief Drive-In donated the proceeds from cheeseburgers sold on April 27th. Supported by other Wallaceburg businesses, the Sombra Township Optimist held an online auction to raise money, and students launched a Rice Krispie Square fundraiser at Christ the King's School. On behalf of the community, I add my hopes and prayers for a speedy path to Seth's, Seth's full recovery. Let's celebrate Wallaceburg people and businesses who stepped up even in lockdown. They truly understand, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Perfect. 
The Honorable Member for Madawaska Restagouche. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Young people are inspiring in my riding. I'd like to highlight a 12-year-old from my riding who decided to get into business, go into business, Malik Duguay, with his own business called Hog Works. He makes and sells magic wands inspired by Harry Potter. The business has grown. He now has made over 200 wands. Everything's handmade. He carves the wood, paints it, and adds copper or metal according to the different models. You can see it uh, all on his website or his Facebook. His business is going well uh, and because he shows a lot of perseverance and creativity, he will be rewarded. On June 9th, he will receive a Leader of Tomorrow Award. With a bit of magic in this pandemic, you can get your own wand by visiting his website or a Facebook page. Best of luck in, the f in this adventure. Calgary Forest Lawn. Mr. Speaker, I want everyone in this house to imagine being a child who is going through something traumatic and just wants to feel loved. Picture this child being approached by an older individual on Instagram who promises gifts and love. Now imagine this child being violated, groomed, and sold into human trafficking by that same predator. According to cybertip.ca, they saw an 81% increase from April to June 2020 of reports of youth who had been sexually exploited. Last week, I introduced Bill C-304 to enforce harsher punishments for child grooming and exploitation. I have two young daughters, and I want to see them and the rest of our youth grow up in a safe environment, free from child groomers and predators. I ask everyone in this house, to support Bill C-304 so we can put a stop to this evil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Portneuf, Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, since 2016, I've had the pleasure of presenting high school graduates with certificates to, march, to mark such an important milestone in their lives. In this time when graduations are being changed or cancelled, we owe it to these young people to still recognize their accomplishment. I'm particularly pleased I was able to continue this initiative by hand signing 810 certificates this year with the following message. Graduating from high school is an important milestone. In this special year, you have developed unique skills that will serve you throughout your life. I want, you, want to congratulate you on your resilience, adaptability, and perseverance. Follow your dreams, and the future is yours. These certificates will be presented to the graduates of the following Port Neuf Jacques Cartier High Schools Dollard des Ormeaux, Louis Jobin, Saint Marc, Mont Saint Sacrement, Seminaire Saint François, Donna Connor, and Pionnier Pavier Laure Gaudreau. Congratulations to all of you and have a great summer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Matna, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister said that the remains of 215 children are from a dark and shameful chapter of our country's history. But Indigenous peoples know that colonization is not just in the past, it is an ongoing reality. More than 50% of children in foster care are Indigenous, but account for less than 8% of child population. More than 30% of inmates in prison are Indigenous, and Inuit in Nunavut die by suicide at nine times the rate as non-Indigenous Canadians. Mr. Speaker, colonization is not a dark chapter in Canadian history. It's a book that the federal institution continues to write. We are tired of living in someone else's story and refuse to continue to have it written for us. We have and will continue to write new chapters and will not ask for permission to live lives full of dignity and respect. We will demand it. Matna, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. In this Environment Week, I'd like to shine a light on the hypocrisy of the government that celebrated Clean Air Day yesterday. They say they want to recognize the importance of good air quality for health, the environment, and the economy. Well, let's go, Mr. Speaker, on health. Health Canada estimates that air pollution contributes annually to 15,300 premature deaths, 4,000 of which are in Quebec, and that's not counting the non-fatal health effects. That's 2.7 million days with asthma symptoms and 35 million days with acute respiratory symptoms. The economy now. 
the economic cost of the health impacts of air pollution for the year 2016 was $120 billion, or 6% of Canada's GDP. That's no small amount. And now the environment. This government continues to happily subsidize the oil and gas industry, which, let's not forget, is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, even ahead of transportation. Can anyone tell me what there is to celebrate? Smoke and mirrors? Conservatives have a clear vision for succeeding Canada's future. But unlike the Liberals, we believe that our country's success lies in the Canadian people, not government. Canadians are the problem solvers, the solution makers, the wealth creators. They have and will continue to make Canada great. Instead of liberating Canada Canadians to succeed without obscene interventions, this government is set on picking winners and losers based on a liberal value system. Whether it be through excessive taxation, meddling with internet algorithms to promote some Canadian creators over others, over-regulating industries that they don't like so that other industries that they do like can succeed, or telling Canadians what they can or cannot say, the current government is obsessed with engineering a future of their making rather than let Canadians determine their own fortune. It's dictatorial, it's destructive, and it's altogether wrong. A Conservative government will secure Canada's future by unleashing the power of Canadians right across the country. Canada's Conservatives will let the people design their future. Honourable Member for Fleetwood, Port Kells. Mr. Speaker, weeks before the discovery of the graves of Indigenous children at the Kamloops Residential School, our weekly webcast of Fleetwood Port Kells featured two stories that illustrated Canada's systematic racism toward Indigenous people. Jenica Greening, President and CEO of the BC Women's Health Foundation, told how Indigenous women still dress in their best clothes to go to the emergency room. Why? Because still, today, it's too often suspected or assumed that they're drunk or high. And if they take their kids in for care, well, there's always the fear that those kids will be apprehended. Keenan McCarthy told us of how he only discovered his heritage shortly before his grandmother passed away, when she told him about her service in England during World War II, only to come home and be denied her demobilization package because she was Métis. Mr. Speaker, much harm has been done by past governments, but we are the government now. Canadians look to us to act on truth and reconciliation, and we will do it. Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Empty shoes are being left at memorials across the country. Flags are at half-mast. Canadian families are grieving the loss of children, but what they haven't seen yet is swift action. We've been asking the government for a new plan and new resources to respond to calls to Action 71 to 76 in the Truth and Reconciliation Report, and to do this by Canada Day. Will the government commit to delivering the plan so that families can begin the process of healing? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are all heartbroken by the discovery of the remains of children at the, at the Kamloops Residential Schools. Our thoughts obviously are with the Kamloops Sequepam First Nation and surrounding communities that had children stolen to that institution. Presently, we are working with those communities who have asked for space to help them with their mental health supports, to help the community members, to help Indigenous peoples across country who are hurting. Uh, and accompanying them in that search for truth. We've invested $27 million. We will continue to do so in helping those communities establish their protocols and give them the space to speak so that we can help them learn the truth and then heal. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Des chaussures vides. Empty shoes. Flags at half staff. Canadians want action. I asked the government for a plan and new resources to respond to calls. Uh, for action 71 to 76 of the Truth and Reconciliation Report by Canada Day. Will the government commit to having a plan to help these families heal? The Honourable Minister. And Mr. Speaker, it is indeed a healing, a healing process for all those Indigenous communities in mourning and particularly Kamloops, whose children were stolen to that institution and some of them who died 
uh, in the residential school in Kamloops. We are here to react and provide help for them. They've asked us for space, but we will accompany them in their need, mental health needs and along the rest of the road. We will find the truth and go through this healing process, which is so important to the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, last night a Liberal spokesperson suggested the government would refuse to turn over documents to the House regarding the security breach at Canada's highest security laboratory in Winnipeg. So far, what the government has released has been heavily redacted and significant correspondence from the Wuhan Institute of Virology has been blacked out. Has the government had any communication with the Chinese government about making this information public? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as uh, we have been repeatedly clear on this side of the House, of course we are committed to sharing information in a manner that will not compromise national security. There is a committee, as the member opposite knows, the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians that is well uh, situated to uh, review these documents. This is an opportunity for the House to participate in this review. And as the member opposite knows, we will never jeopardize national security, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This security breach shows the Minister has already jeopardized Canadian security. We know from the first media inquiries on these scientists that the lab directly involves security services and the Privy Council office. The Prime Minister, that Minister, they knew they had a security breach on their hands from the start. And they know it's this Parliament's job to hold them to account for it. Are Canadians going to get the truth from this minister, or is she at the origins of yet another Liberal cover-up? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the researchers are no longer with the National Microbiology Lab. As I have said, this government takes national security extremely seriously. In fact, as the member opposite knows, we have been uh, repeatedly committed to providing the House with the documentation. There isn't a, a committee that is appropriate in this House to review that documentation. And I will just say this, we will not play games, Mr. Speaker, with national security, unlike the member opposite. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Le Président. Mr. Speaker, a Liberal spokesperson suggested that the government would refuse to provide the House with the documents concerning the breach at the Winnipeg lab. The documents provided by the government are redacted, including important correspondence with the Wuhan Institute. Has the government had contact with the Chinese government to make this information public? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've repeatedly said in this House, the government is prepared to turn over the documents while protecting national security. And the member opposite knows that there is an appropriate committee of the House that can look at these documents. It is important that the member not play games with Canadian safety and security. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker, the National Assembly passed unanimous resolutions demanding that Bill 101 apply to federally regulated workplaces. That is why the Government of Quebec introduced Bill 96, which seeks to apply Bill 101, but in its document announcing linguistic reform, the federal government is not proposing that Bill 101 apply to protect French. Rather, it's proposing to apply the Official Languages Act to protect bilingualism. Why not do what Quebec wants unanimously by applying Bill 101? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, we want to ensure that the right to work in French, the right to be served in French, and not discriminate because we're francophone in federally regulated workplaces in Quebec and in regions with high francophone uh, communities be protected. That's our commitment. That's what we'll do. And I'm pleased to work with my colleague on the issue. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Just, um, I understand my colleague's will to protect French in Quebec. And I'm holding my hand out. What the federal government can do is to ensure that federally regulated workplaces are places where people's language of work is French. And that's only what Bill 101 can guarantee. That's why the bloc tabled or introduced rather a Bill C-254 to ensure that Bill 101 could apply to federally regulated workplaces. My colleague says she wants to protect French. Well, I'm holding my hand out. 
Will they support our bill? The Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, as I mentioned, and as has been repeated by my colleague, that the Government of Canada wants to protect French because French is uh, declining in Quebec and across the country. We will do it. We're the first government in our history to do so, and that is why we will ensure that we table a legislation on the Official Languages Act to ensure that this is the case. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Le Tribunal Canadien de la... The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal has ruled that Canada discriminated against Indigenous children's rights. Despite that, the Prime Minister continues to take Indigenous children to court. Will the Prime Minister support our motion and stop taking Indigenous children to court? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker. Our government and our Prime Minister has been clear. Our goal is full compensation, full, fair compensation to promote the healing of those infected by the in historic inequities when it comes to child services. We support and continue to support the fact that there are unresolved fundamental issues regarding the jurisdiction. We continue to work to ensure that all First Nations children will have a fair full compensation. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found that Canada discriminated Indigenous children and found that they did so willfully and recklessly. Despite that, the Prime Minister continues to fight Indigenous kids in court. Indigenous survivors of residential schools are demanding justice, but the Prime Minister is fighting them in court as well. How can people take this Prime Minister's commitment to reconciliation seriously when he continues to fight Indigenous children and residential school survivors in court? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear with the member opposite and with all Canadians. Every First Nations child that suffered discrimination at the hands of the Child and Family Services system that is broken will receive just, fair and equitable compensation. We maintain that there are substantive unresolved questions on the CHRT jurisdiction, on the other court cases that are outstanding in class actions. We are in discussions with the parties, but the party, those discussions do remain confidential out of respect for the process. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Shakurami Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, our relationship with the Chinese Communist regime is currently strained. The situation of the two Michaels, as well as the genocide of the Uyghurs, are just more reasons poisoning our relationship. Our National Microbiology Lab has an international reputation for scientific excellence. Can the government ensure that no scientists with ties to the Communist regime or the Chinese People's Liberations Army are currently working in our labs? The Honorable Minister. The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Um, I apologize, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me first start by saying what a crown jewel we have in the National Microbiology Lab. This is a, a, a lab that has provided amazing service to Canadians through this pandemic and indeed before. In fact, this lab is well known around the world for its efforts to understand uh, pathologies and support Canadians. Um, as I have said, it is important as well that Canada collaborate in research and science. In fact, uh, attending the G7 virtually collaboration uh, has been raised a number of times today as an important principle to not only managing COVID-19, but also dealing with pandemics in the future. We'll continue. The, 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 the Honourable Member for Shikurumi La Fjorda. The Honourable Member for Shokudami Le Fjord. I apologize, Mr. Speaker. Two scientists have already been terminated after sending samples of highly contagious pathogens to the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China, among them samples of Ebola and Hennepa viruses. This uh, security breach is extremely concerning. 
Why is the government refusing to take actions that would not ensure that the Chinese government could not do whatever it wanted without any repercussions? The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, we see the Conservatives trying to sow fear in the work that the National Microbiology Lab conducts. I will say this, as he knows, the scientists and researchers in question are no longer with the lab. The, secure, uh, that is, the lab is a secure facility. Everybody working and visiting at the National Lab must undergo security clearance and screening and adhere to strict protocols and policies. We'll never put the health and safety of Canadians at risk, Mr. Speaker, but we will continue to research and support research and science on this side of the house honorable member for abbotsford last week i asked the finance minister how much her government has invested in the china controlled asian infrastructure investment bank she refused to say i asked her how much more taxpayers money she planned to throw away on this foreign bank she wouldn't say i asked her whether she had made the funding of this china-led bank conditional upon china releasing the two michaels she refused to say, why won't the minister place the welfare of two innocent Canadians over her fascination with appeasing China? The Honourable Minister. With great respect, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the Honourable Member, it is deeply disappointing for him to suggest that any member of this House, regardless of party, would put the appeasement of a foreign power ahead of the well-being of two Canadians who've been in arbitrary captivity for such a long period of time. It remains our top priority to secure the release of the two Michaels, and we have a number of other outstanding matters with the Chinese government, such as the treatment of Uyghurs within their borders or the 300,000 Canadians in Hong Kong. With respect on our side of the House, and I expect for all parliamentarians, the well-being of Canadians comes first. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, the Liberal record speaks for itself. Time after time, the minister has refused to say how much she has spent on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, but government documents show that she's spending hundreds of millions of taxpayers' dollars on this China-led bank. She won't even tell us whether she made the return of the two Michaels a condition of her investment with the Chinese Communist regime. Mr. Speaker, the two Michaels deserve better than that. Why is the minister pouring money into this foreign bank when China won't release two innocent Canadians who are languishing in prison. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, we will continue to engage with uh, other developed economies on matters of, of global concern. Uh, but with respect, I want to reassert that our top priority when it comes to our relations with China is securing the release of the two Michaels. We remain focused on ensuring the fair and equitable treatment of the Uyghur population, and we are focused on the well-being of Canadians in Hong Kong. I do not take, uh, uh, take kindly to the suggestion that we are putting the appeasement of a foreign power uh, ahead of the well-being of Canadians whatsoever. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, in six years, only 12 of the 94 calls to action on the Truth and Reconciliation Report have been completed. At that rate, it will be 2057 before we address them all. There are 231 calls to justice in the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Report. With this government's track record, we are looking at 115 years to respond to these recommendations. The Prime Minister promised action. So when will the government provide action, attention, urgency and resources to these important recommendations and reports? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would remind the member that these calls are for all of Canada and particularly non-Indigenous Canadians. Uh, the federal government has a very large role to play in this and there are a number of calls to action that we have that we have moved on quite quickly. I would note the implementation passage and royal assent of C91 on Indigenous languages, C92 on child and family services. These are all transformative documents to fill the inequities that have characterized uh, our relationship as a country. We will continue to move on. Today's pathway announced by Minister Bennett is one that is equally transformative with respect to missing and murdered Indigenous women. And I would point to the over $2 billion in the budget dedicated to implementing that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brook. Speaker, let me quote the Native Women's Association of Canada, who could no longer partner to the toxic, dysfunctional MMIWG action plan process. They said they experienced lateral violence and more red tape. 
and that the government didn't seem to have a plan that was concrete with initiatives and incentives measured and costed out, and that the process has been purely bureaucratic approach to this issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. Speaker, when will the Minister take seriously the criticism being directed at their government and act rather than releasing another plan for another plan? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier today, contributing partners from across Canada came together to release a national action plan and the federal pathway to finally end this ongoing tragedy. The federal pathway is a key contribution in the national action plan that will lead real, lasting, and widespread changes. We provided funding to Indigenous women's organizations, including NWAC, to engage with their membership on their priorities to be included in the national action plan. We're greatly appreciative of NWAC's work. Uh, from past engagement efforts, uh, value their input to date, respect their position, and we'll continue to work with them through the Canada and WAC Accord. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Mr. Speaker, the federal government is sleeping at the wheel when it comes to temporary foreign workers. And those aren't my words. They're the words of the Minister of Labour of Quebec. He's sick of the fact that every year farmers and business people are unable to get their workers on time. Administrative delays are endless. Workers are stuck in the chaos at the Canadian border, and businesses are paying a fortune to bring over workers that never come. What will it take for the federal government to get busy so we can stop wasting our time, our money, and our crops? The Honourable Minister. Our government recognizes the importance of temporary foreign workers for our producers and our food processors. We're working tirelessly to ensure that temporary foreign workers can arrive safely in Canada by supporting employers with additional costs incurred to accommodate the isolation period. All federal departments involved in this program have worked together to simplify processes. I have worked hand in hand with my counterpart in Quebec, Monsieur Boulet, and we are working very hard together. And we understand the importance of these, these workers to our food, food security, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Saint Jean, Mr. Speaker, Quebec has actually asked the minister to transfer the program if he can't take care of it himself. This means that the time for discussions are over, long over. In fact, one out of two small businesses are turning down contracts due to a labor shortage. We need to accelerate the files processing. We need to relax the 10 percent threshold to allow people to get hired. And we need to ensure that people, workers, can get to Quebec. Is the minister going to start taking care of the program, or will he transfer it to Quebec as Quebec is asking? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can assure everyone in this House and all Canadians that we respect and understand the role that temporary foreign workers have played in ensuring our food security during this pandemic, and they deserve to be safe. We're ensuring employers are preparing to safely welcome and quarantine workers. We're ensuring employers meet quarantine program obligations. We're improving the tip line to provide services in multiple languages. We're, we're providing direct assistance to workers, and we're responding quickly to emerging issues. Mr. Speaker, this is a, a, an example of a program where we're working hand in hand with Quebec to ensure that um, employers and in particular ag agriculture employers get the workers they need in Quebec. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Berthier, Masquinanger. Mr. Speaker, our farmers pay dearly for their temporary foreign workers. They pay for labour market studies required by the federal government. They pay for quarantine facilities. And the chaos at the, in terms of the border management means that the workers never get here, but they pay anyway. When a farmer has to pay immigration consultants to be able to harvest asparagus, the problem is really serious. When will the minister simplify and accelerate the program? And if he doesn't want to take care of it, transfer it to Quebec. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've made many important changes to this program over the past year to ensure that employers across the country get the temporary foreign workers that they need to ensure our food security here in Canada. We've also made sure workers are better protected during this time of crisis and work very closely with both employers and source countries to ensure the safety of all citizens of every single worker here in Canada, including our temporary foreign workers. As I've said, I have a great working relationship with my Quebec counterpart. We meet and speak regularly, and that's because we know we have a common interest in keeping our workers safe and our employers have the labour they need to deliver for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, it's appalling the Prime Minister's disregard for the lowest earning households in this country. The government's pandemic aid was focused on the top 20% of income earners who received 
6700 while those who are working to make ends meet got 4100 it's apparent that the programs were ill-designed, especially for those in dire need. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister agree today that a review of the efficiency and effectiveness of these programs will be completed immediately? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we've delivered our emergency and recovery benefits to Canadians, we've absolutely reviewed them. We've made changes as we've course corrected as a pandemic threw different balls into our court. Mr. Speaker, 8 million Canadians got access to the CERB, 700,000 students, the Canada Emergency Student Benefit, 1.9 million Canadians on the CRB, 582,000 Canadians on the CRSB, the Sickness Benefit, Mr. Canadian, Mr. Speaker, and another 500,000 Canadians on the Caregiving Benefit. Never mind all the people, almost a million uh, applications for EI that's been received. That's almost 12 million Canadians, Mr. Speaker, who have benefited from our emergency and recovery and our changes to EI. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister irresponsibly financed our country with hundreds of billions of dollars of new debt, and he did it on the backs of those struggling most. Of the $95.2 billion in direct government transfers related to COVID-19 last year, the bottom 20% of earners in this country got just 14%. Mr. Speaker, Canadians needed help, but due to poorly directed programs, those who needed it most were left behind. Will the Prime Minister fix this mess through calculated actions, or will he just continue to blindly make decisions, hoping things will just work out? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member's line of questioning suffers from deficits of both fact and principle. On the facts where he says it's been irresponsible, I'd point him to the AAA credit rating reaffirmed this week by Moody's, which has also been upheld by other major credit rating agencies. The fact is we are on a sustainable path. As a matter of principle, he suggests these programs are flawed when from the very beginning, the Conservatives literally held a press conference so they could oppose the big fat government programs that have actually kept 9 million Canadians with the ability to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, as you will well know, we will be there for Canadians as long as it takes, no matter what it takes. The Honourable Member for Mégantique-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, while federal public service retirees are impatiently waiting their compensation for Phoenix issues, we learn that the government has sent over $9 million to people who have died. While it's preparing to create a two-tiered system for seniors, it has no qualms about giving more help to wealthier Canadians during the pandemic. Why did wealthier families get an average of $2,600 more than the neediest families? How can the Prime Minister explain that painting deceased individuals or wealthier individuals helped Canadians in need during the pandemic? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have taken a disability inclusive response to, uh, approach to our pandemic response since the beginning. We created a one time payment that 1.7 million Canadians got. No one had to apply for this payment, Mr. Speaker. It was based on eligibility for federal disability resport, supports. And yes, Mr. Speaker, there was a group of Canadians who received this money that the government had not been advised yet that they had deceased and were working on this. But Mr. Speaker, we created this one time payment. No one had to apply. Everybody was eligible for federal supports. That's how it worked, and it worked for 1.7 million Canadians. L'honorable député de Rosemont, la petite patrie. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals just promised $5 million for Laurentian University, but the university needs $100 million. Does the minister know that this is far too little? Does she really expect Ontario to provide the missing $95 million? When will the minister show leadership and finally protect the French fact across the country? When will the minister introduce a bill to modernize the Official Languages Act with binding language clauses? L'honorable minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, what's happening at Lund University is unacceptable. Essentially, a Francophone university, any university in the country, should not have to use the Creditor Protection Act in order to solve its underfunding by the province. So what are we doing? We're working on solutions. We're investing $5 million to ensure that the community can develop a project by and for Francophones in Northern Ontario to finally have an institution for Francophones who want to conduct post-secondary studies. 
Of course, we're also working on the Official Languages Act. The Honorable Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, the Veterans Ombudsperson's report released yesterday says VAC has been telling survivors of military sexual trauma to get help somewhere else. For too long, this government has been blocking the voices of women in the military. Women veterans who experience this trauma have been asking for VAC to fund a peer support program for years to share their stories in a safe place and begin to heal. Veterans should not have to keep settling for less. Will the minister step up and implement a peer support program for your survivors. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we thank the Veterans Ombuds for her report and agree with her recommendations. We know how important peer support can be for survivors, and in Budget 2021, we committed to implementing a dedicated program for veterans and members of the Canadian Armed Forces. It's our responsibility to be there for those who are harmed in the service of our country, and we will continue to work to ensure that survivors of military sexual trauma receive the support they need. Thank you, Ms. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Two years ago today, the National Inquiry for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls released 231 calls for justice and called for the federal, provincial, territorial and Indigenous governments to work together to build a national action plan to end the ongoing national tragedy and shame of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited LGBTQIA plus people. They all have the right to live and be respected and valued in their communities. And Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Indigenous Services please update the House on our government's progress on co-developing... The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank the member opposite for her advocacy and, and deep personal commitment to these matters earlier Today, contributing partners from across Canada came together to release the National Action Plan and the Federal Pathway to address the ongoing tragedy. The Federal Pathway is a key contribution to the National Action Plan that will lead to real, lasting and widespread change. And, and by working with over 100 Indigenous women, 2SL, GBTQIA plus people, including Indigenous, provincial and territorial partners, we now have a comprehensive plan to put into place concrete measures and the accountability framework that will truly keep Indigenous women, girls and 2SL, GBTQIA a people plus safe. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. In spite of repeated requests, the Liberals have never produced evidence to show that their hotel quarantine program stops the spread of COVID over other measures. However, there is evidence of COVID-19 outbreaks at these facilities, and there's also evidence of sexual assaults occurring there. Now the government's own expert panel of scientists has called on the Liberals to scrap the program, but instead today, the Liberals are inexplicably doubling down on it. Will the Liberals let the hotel quarantine program expire on June 21st? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me start by saying a huge thank you to the immunizers and Canadians from coast to coast to coast, because in fact, today, Canada is leading the G7 in the number of vaccines administered. This is a good news story for Canada, Mr. Speaker. In fact, it is a story of Team Canada. And I want to say uh, that we will make sure that whatever we do next on the border will be through the lens of science and evidence and in full partnership with provinces and territories. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. But was this health minister in early 2020 that didn't listen to science and said that border measures didn't work and subsequently refused to close the border when it really, really mattered? She's continuing the trend of not making science-based decisions today, and that's really unfortunate. The government's own expert panel of scientists, with a report full of science, are calling on the government to immediately scrap the hotel quarantine program in, other, uh, in favor of other measures. Will this minister finally listen to science and let the hotel quarantine program expire on June 21st? The Honourable Minister. Yet again, Mr. Speaker, we see the member opposite fail to recognize that science evolves and that it is a new virus and it is 
a global pandemic, the likes of which we have not seen in 100 years. And in fact, that's exactly what we've been doing, Mr. Speaker. We've been following the advice of public health scientists and researchers. That's why, Mr. Speaker, that we're in the position that we are today. In fact, I want to say thank you to all of the immunizers across the country and Canadians who have stepped up in historic ways to get vaccinated. We're leading the G7, Mr. Speaker. Over 28.6 million vaccines have been delivered to provinces and territories. We can see the finish line, Mr. Speaker. I'll just wait till the conversation ends. We only have so much time. I, I, well, this, I just want to remind the. I just want to remind the honourable members that if they want to cross over one way or the other and talk to each other, that's okay. But shouting across uh, just doesn't work. The honourable order, order. The honourable member for Steveson, Richmond East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for doing a great job. The Prime Minister wondered how a young family could afford a home. Yet the Liberals' only solution to this appears to be slapping 1% tax on foreign home ownership. I would like to point out that in my home of Richmond, in the past year during pandemic travel ban, benchmark house prices shot up by over 22%, edging close to $2 million. Will the government put aside their sound bites and red herrings and detail a meaningful solution to the housing crisis? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, every Canadian deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. And as the numbers show in the national housing uh, uh, National Housing Strategy Report tabled this week, we have helped over 200,000 families get the housing that they need through building new homes, repairing existing ones, and providing affordability support. And since 2015, our government has supported the creation of over 100,000 new units and repaired over 300,000 more across the, the country. It is very rich for the party opposite to talk about affordable housing when they didn't do anything in their almost nine years of power. The Honourable Member for Steves in Richmond East. Mr. Speaker, young Canadians are struggling to afford a home. The first time home buyers benefit, it's inadequate. And publicly, the Prime Minister ignorantly underestimates the housing costs in the Greater Vancouver area. Perhaps that's why Budget 2021 proposes nothing useful for young families. Will the government finally admit how out of touch they are with Canadian needs and detail an effective solution to the housing crisis immediately? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is very rich for, for the party opposite to talk about this issue. They provided no leadership and no serious investments in housing. We introduced the national housing strategy because we believe every Canadian deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. As part of that strategy, we introduced the first time home buyer incentive, which will help many middle class families achieve the dream of home ownership. We're also expanding the first time home buyer incentive to enhance eligibility in Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria, and the greater regions in that area by raising the qualifying income threshold from 120,000 to 150,000 household income. The party opposite has simply no credibility when it comes to affordable housing, Mr. Speaker. They can run, but they can't hide. L'honorable député de Rivière du Nord. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The judicial appointment process is broken. Everyone knows that the Liberals are screening candidates to find the ones who are good donors. The Prime Minister's office, ministers, MPs, the entire Liberal family consult with each other to ensure that judges chosen are Liberals. But I'm sure that even they would say that it's dangerous to mix partisanship and our justice system. Will the government agree to create a committee to study the judicial appointment process to ensure that it is impartial. L'honorable ministre. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that Canadians' trust in our justice system requires a transparent and responsible selection process. That process selects candidates that reflect Canada's diversity. Since 2016, we've appointed high-quality judges whose diversity reflects the face of Canada. I am proud of the nominations that we have made. I can assure my honorable colleague that the process is independent and aims for diversity and quality. The honorable member for Rivière-du-Nord. 
We don't doubt that they're high-quality appointments. That's not the issue. All we're proposing is a committee study of the judicial appointment process, and the Liberals are already panicking. If their appointment process is so great, why are they afraid to have a committee study it? If the process is as independent as they say it is, what do they have to lose by having MPs and experts confirm it? If it's not true that they're setting up a system to make sure they appoint good liberal friends as judges, what are they afraid of? We want an impartial system. Could we please have just justice? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have a just and impartial system, which was set up to deal with criticism that had been made of the process under the previous Conservative government. We have an advisory committee that's working very hard throughout Canada to analyze candidates and half of those who apply don't pass this step. This step is completely independent from politics. We have set up a system in 2016 and it works very well. I'm very proud of its results. For Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Speaker, the Agriculture Minister said that support for the 14-day quarantine uh, for, for foreign agriculture workers was, quote, an emergency program and not a compensation program. However, it expires August 31st, even though farm workers will continue to arrive in Canada for the fall harvest, and farmers will continue to incur expenses. Ending the program before quarantine restrictions are lifted is premature and completely unacceptable. So either the minister thinks the emergency is over, or the government just doesn't care about food sovereignty. Which is it? The Honourable Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Évidemment que notre... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, our government is highly committed to supporting our farmers and our agri-food businesses because our food security depends on it. We've implemented a host of measures to help them, whether it be to help lodge workers safely or to help them to welcome foreign workers. Our program absorbs part of the fee associated with quarantine. That program is coming to an end at the end of August. It was an emergency program and not a compensation program. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, summer's coming and so are seasonal jobs. Two companies in my writing, Groupe Verti and Emondage Pouliau, are already on the verge of losing valuable contracts due to a lack of staff. Their files have been sitting for quite some time in IRCC's office. Time's running out, deadlines are getting close. The Minister of Immigration has announced improvements to the processing of files for the next few years, but what about now? Are we telling these companies that they're going to lose their contracts or even their businesses? Is this really the message the Minister wants to send? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're well on our way to meet the targets set to, for 2021. Since September 1st, 2020, more than 60,000 temporary foreign workers have arrived in Canada to support the economy. In April, more than 11,500 temporary foreign workers arrived. More than 8,000 more are ready to travel and over 3,000 more requests are being processed. We have surpassed our targets for 2021 and I will continue to work with my colleague on this matter. Oh, Mr. Speaker, last month the government released the details of its financial aid program for this country's struggling airports. The Regina International Airport will receive approximately $2.6 million. That's enough to keep them operational for about two months. Meanwhile, the government's bailout of Air Canada included $10 million for, for executive bonuses. Mr. Speaker, why are the executives of Air Canada more important to this government than the entire Regina International Airport? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for his question, but I want to take the moment to uh, correct him. He's comparing apples and oranges. Uh, and let me repeat what the Prime Minister said yesterday. Uh, we were disappointed 
by the decision that Air Canada has taken uh, uh, to pay executive compensation prior to the signing of the agreement. Our agreement ensures that uh, there's limit on uh, executive compensation. Secondly, I am really happy to announce to Canadians and, and to let them know that we are standing by airports and providing support at a time where we know the pandemic has had a significant impact on their operations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. L'honorable député de Châteauguay, la colle. Monsieur le Président, cette semaine est... Mr. Speaker, this week is National Access Ability Week. It's an opportunity to celebrate the valuable contributions of Canadian men and women with disabilities and to recognize the efforts of individuals, communities, and organizations who are actively working to remove barriers to accessibility and inclusion. Can the Minister inform the House how Budget 2021 supports Canadians with disabilities and helps to build an inclusive Canada? Honorable Minister. I would like to thank the member for Châteauguay-Lacol for her advocacy for people with disabilities. Yes, absolutely, this week is National Access Ability Week. We have done more than any other government on inclusion and accessibility. Budget 2021 builds on our groundbreaking work by continuing to implement our Nothing Without Us plan. Inclusive child care students with disabilities, training opportunities and job creation for Canadians with disabilities, and we're expanding eligibility for the disability tax credit. We're moving forward, Mr. Speaker, with the first ever disability inclusion action plan to better support persons with disabilities. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that answer is just false. Since 2018, the Liberals have been trying to cut funding for, for Canadians with disabilities. Last winter, at the height of the pandemic, the Liberals tried to slip past a $4 million cut, but the disability community fought back. Libraries across Canada, including in Saskatoon and the city of Delta in the minister's own writing, fought and shamed the Liberals into reversing their cruel cuts. This is Accessibility Week, and so it would be a perfect time for the government to reverse course. When will this minister do the right thing and finally commit to a long-term funding solution? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I don't know where to begin. We have championed the, the fact that everyone should be able to access information and reading materials. That's why we developed the first ever and have been implementing a long-term strategy for the production of alternate format materials that includes support to the publishing sector, advancements in technology, and invent investment in nonprofits. In recognizing that the pandemic has affected the timeline of this transition and the ongoing need for alternate format materials, we are actually funding CELA and NELS with an additional $1 million in addition to the money we committed in the fall economic statement. This is keeping us on the path to accessible publishing and ensuring that persons with disabilities continue to have access, particularly during this unprecedented time. The Honourable Member for Charleswood St. James, Assiniboia, Headingley. I believe the Honourable Member's on mute. Uh, There you go. Perfect. Uh, if I may start again. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this week is National Accessibility Week to raise awareness to promote a more accessible Canada. My private member's bill, Bill C-256, waives the capital gains tax on an arm's length sale of private shares or real estate when the proceeds of the sale are donated to a charity. This will generate up to $200 million per year for charities, including those promoting accessibility and supporting Canadians living with disabilities. Will the government commit to supporting Canadians living with disabilities by voting yes on Bill C-256? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, we've done more to support Canadians with disabilities than any other government in the history of our country. We're working now on a very exciting disability inclusion action plan, which we laid out the parameters of in the fall economic statement. We're going to create a Canada disability benefit, an employment strategy. Uh, we're going to reform and modernize our eligibility processes for federal government disability supports and create a dignified approach to disability across this government. Mr. Speaker, when we put in place the Accessible Canada Act two years ago, we made the most historic advancement in disability rights since the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982, and we're just getting started. Thank you. 
L'honorable député de montmagny lillet kamouraska rivière du loup Monsieur le Président, on savait que les libéraux ont déjà... Mr. Speaker, we knew that the Liberals wanted to give the dead a vote before, but this week, we found out that they sent them checks as well. It's unprecedented. How can the Prime Minister justify sending $9.2 million in COVID assistance to people who have died? It's unbelievable. In this National Accessibility Week, will he claw back this irresponsibly distributed money, this incorrectly sent money, and direct it to people who actually need it? The Honourable Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Colleague for that question. Mr. Speaker, we delivered a $600 one-time payment during the pandemic to over 1.7 million Canadians who are eligible for federal disability support programs. Mr. Speaker, this was an automatic payment. No one had to apply for this. You got it if you were eligible for the Disability Tax Credit, Veterans Affairs Disability Support Programs, or the CPP Disability. Mr. Speaker, there was a time lapse between the establishment of the list and when Canadians received their check. And of course, unfortunately, in that period, some Canadians had passed away and we hadn't been informed yet of their having passed away and we're working to, to, to remedy this, Mr. Speaker. But let's be very clear, 1.7 million Canadians got $600 in their desperate time of need. L'honorable député de Miramichi, Grand Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know how crucial rail transportation is for communities across the country, including in my riding of, uh, with Via Rail's ocean passenger train which links Halifax to Montreal and the rest of the country. With the pandemic, many passenger rail routes, including this one, have been suspended. Can the minister update this house on future plans to bring back this important and indispensable public transit system for our region? Thank you, Mr. Minis uh, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my friend, the member from Miramichi, Grand Lake, for his question and advocacy. He and I, along with uh, New Brunswick Liberal MPs, have had discussions on the current situation with transportation in their region. The pandemic has dramatically impacted the transport industry, and I want to assure him and his constituents that I will continue to work with him and our colleagues to have reliable transport options. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, last October, this House passed a motion requiring the government to provide the Health Committee with important documents concerning the COVID crisis no later than December 7. Liberals bitterly fought against this move for accountability and transparency and admitted there were at least a million documents in their possession. As of today, eight months later, they've disclosed fewer than 9,000. Will the Liberals admit that they are deliberately withholding documents, showing contempt for Parliament, and explain to Canadians what they are hiding? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, on the contrary, every step of the way, we've been transparent with Canadians. And in fact, I have appeared before the Health Committee multiple times, as have my officials. We are always available to speak to Canadians. We have supplied the documents in due course, as requested by the House of Commons. We'll continue to work to get those documents to the Health Committee and to be there to answer the questions of the committee. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Grenville. It is dangerously misleading for the government to suggest significant progress is being made on 80% of the TRC calls to action. I, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt the Honourable Member if she can move her microphone up uh, just a touch and it'll make it clear for all of us to hear and the interpreter as well. Sorry to interrupt. We'll let her start from the top. We'll start the clock at the top as well. It is dangerously misleading for the government to suggest significant progress is being made on 80% of the TRC calls to action. Endless meetings and process is no substitute for substance. Leadership is required to change colonial laws, policies, and practices that perpetuate systemic racism and injustice. The Prime Minister knows that adjusting the ongoing colonial legacy requires comprehensive Indigenous rights recognition framework. How do I know this? The Prime Minister said it in this House on February the 14th, 2018. I, I'm going to have to interrupt. I believe we have a problem with translation. There's a, a, an issue with the mic. Uh, it's very uh, distorted and loud. We want to make sure we get the question. There we go. That sounds better already. Try that again. Put it back down to where it was. Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe bring it down a little better? bit more. Maybe bring it down just a touch more. Uh, I'm thinking the volume or whatever you turn down. Okay. Let's. Yeah. Whatever you whatever you turn down. Maybe turn down a little bit more. Just. 
Oh, okay, very good. Well, let's try it again. Maybe uh, it's, 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 uh, some of us have very long, loud voices, and uh, we'll start right from the top again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is dangerously misleading for the government to suggest significant progress is being made on 80% of the TRC calls. We're, we're, we're still getting a hard time with the... the uh, I'm getting uh, input that the level maybe on the microphone is too high. <laughs> Maybe the wrong mic is selected. I don't know. It's uh, try, try. We we can try until we hopefully get it right. Maybe try distancing the boom even further down. Or let's try that right there. Try it. Okay, let's try that. The honourable member for Vancouver Granville. <laughs> Thank you. It is dangerously misleading for the government to suggest significant progress is being made. I'm, I'm sorry, we're still not getting any uh, translation. Uh, it is. Any suggestions? We'll, we'll try one more time, and then we'll get IT to take care of things. Uh, the honourable the honourable member. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we'll go. We'll go with that for now, and then we'll work with IT to get it going. Okay. Thank Over you. Granville. It is dangerously misleading for the government to suggest significant progress is being made on. Institute for substance. It's not working. <sighs> okay, I'm going to I'm going to suggest the honourable member. It's these are technical things that I'm sure the IT people will be able to fix. But I, I'll, I'll just uh, check with the minister to see if she if if he got enough of the uh, the question that he can answer. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, let, let's do it one more time. If not, we'll go to the minister. The honourable member for Vancouver Granville, take a deep breath. You're on. <laughs> It is dangerously misleading for the government to suggest significant progress is being made on 80% of the TRC calls to action. Endless meetings and process is no substitute for substance. Leadership I'm, I'm afraid we're still having trouble. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm sure we'll get it figured out. We're going to have to work with the IT. But I'm going to ask the minister to see if he... I'll, I'll see if they want if they have enough to answer the question. The honourable minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in, indeed, I do. I, I want to take this moment uh, in front of the House to thank the former Attorney General and Minister of Justice for the work that she did to move these important issues forward in answering the TRC's calls to action and the MMIW's call for justice. Uh, the work that she did in making sure that Indigenous languages affirm their inherent rights uh, to have a rightful place in this country, that the child and family services that has betrayed Indigenous children and is broken in this country was reformed through C-92. Uh, it's a time to reflect, obviously, in this time of mourning, the speed at which reconciliation is going. But as we continue to search for the truth, I think it is also time to recognize the progress and the tens of billions of dollars this government has invested in reconciliation. And I want to thank the former Attorney General and Minister Justice for the work that she has done in contributing to this. Okay, I'm afraid that's all the time we have uh, for today, and we'll see if we can get that fixed. Uh, uh, I just encourage all members, uh, check out the microphones on. It's hard to predict, but uh, sometimes by doing it ahead of time and doing a quick check, we could uh, maybe uh, resolve the issues. We have a point of order. Uh, we have a point of order. Uh, the Honourable Member, I don't see any hands up. For Sandwich Gulf Islands. For Sandwich Gulf Islands. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my virtual hand is up there in the corner. Uh, I just, it, it's uh, given the technical difficulties that the Honourable Member for Vancouver Granville just experienced, I return to the point that we, we should have more time within question period for members with a status such as herself, whose voice is so important in this country. And perhaps we could add uh, one slot to next Wednesday so she can ask her question again. Thank you.
It's definitely something worth discussing about adding another slot somewhere for the repeat of that question. We'll discuss it and I'll get back to the chamber with, uh, with uh, something on that. Uh, well, well, we'll do it if the... No other points of order? L'honorable député. The honourable member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, it's a motion for unanimous consent that I'd like to move. There have been consultations among the parties, and I think you'd find there's unanimous consent for the following motion, that this House condemn the decision of senior management of Air Canada to pay themselves $20 million in executive bonuses when they receive $6 billion in public assistance. All those opposed to what the Honourable Member is proposing will please say nay. Okay, okay, the House has heard the terms of the motion. Is it all those opposed to the motion will please say nay? Carried. The Honourable Member for Saint-Hyacinthe-Bagot has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. 